Uh, thank you very much for the uh, introduction and the invitation. And uh, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Shang Li Liu. Uh, I'm from uh, Nanjing University of uh, Aeronautics and uh, Astronautics. Uh, I'm graduated from uh, uh, Georgia Institute of Technology from uh, 2016, and then joined in uh, NUAA. Uh, today, uh, the topic is full spectrum solar uh, thermal conversion and storage via photonic nanofluids. And this presentation is about to be given by uh, Professor Yi Ming Xuan, but unfortunately, um, due to very tedious uh, uh, administration procedures, we didn't get the visa on time, so I will present on behalf of him. And uh, uh, Professor Yi Ming Xuan is uh, one of the early uh, researchers in the nanofluid field. Uh, this is some uh, early publications of him. And uh, uh, today's talk will cover uh, five parts. First, I'll give a very brief introduction of the background. And then uh, I will discuss about the uh, volumetric uh, solar thermal conversion. And then uh, followed by the multifunctional uh, nanofluids for uh, efficient solar power uh, conversion. And then uh, full spectrum solar energy cascade utilization and then followed by uh, a concurrent part. So uh, we all know that for the water energy consumption is increasing very fast, about uh, um, annually 3% uh, in the last decade. So that means the energy consumption uh, um, has doubled from, uh, uh, doubled from 1982 to 2015. And unfortunately, the fossil fuel uh, reserves are very limited, so it cannot meet our demand uh, forever. Actually, the, we, we will run out of the oil at 2052 and the natural gas at 2016 and the coal at 2088. And uh, the shortage of fossil fuels is not the only problem we are facing, but also uh, the increasing concentration of CO2. So if we take a look at this trend, it, it is increasing very fast. And uh, according to this trend, the atmosphere CO2 uh, levels will be uh, predicted to be double the pre-industrial uh, levels by 2050. And there are many sources for the CO2 emission, but if we take a look at this uh, picture, we can see that about 73% of the emission is caused by producing electricity to meet our demand. So, um, so it will be of great significance if we can uh, produce electricity in a very low carbon wave. And the, the, the current annual water consumption is about 2.1 times uh, 10 to the uh, 13th power uh, kilowatts hour. Uh, while the amount of solar energy we receive per hour is even uh, eight times higher. So that means the solar energy is no doubt abundant enough to uh, power the world in a very low carbon wave. And we all know that the solar cells and the solar thermal power plants are the most two uh, known and uh, very popular ways to convert the solar energy into electricity. And uh, if we take a look at the CO2 emission uh, per kilowatt hour, we can see that the, for the solar cells, it, it will emit 20 to 40 uh, grams. And for solar thermal power plants, it's about 15. It is very, very low compared with the coal. Uh, uh, you may wonder why for a solar cell we still have uh, CO2 emission. That's uh, because during the um, production of the solar cells, it will, it will cost a lot of electricity and will, and will emit uh, CO2. And uh, the longevity of the solar cells is not infinite by only 20 to 30 years. Uh, from, from this point, we can see that for the solar thermal power plants, it is even cleaner compared with the solar cells. And uh, also it has other uh, advantages, especially it can uh, share the same uh, industrial base with the current uh, um, coal uh, power plants. And also it has a very cheap energy storage because we store heat rather than electricity. For electricity, uh, for the lithium battery, it is expensive and also it cannot withstand more than 500 times uh, and charging and uh, um, and uh, in charging. <coughs> but for uh, some energy story, we can uh, repeat it for, seven, for uh, tens of thousand times, no problem. And it is predictable, and uh, it can provide uh, four, uh, 24 hours and uh, 17 power. 
That's why we can see uh, the installed capacity of the global solar thermal keeps increasing. And uh, according to the International Energy uh, Agency, the solar thermal capacity will, um, will be uh, about 11% of the global electricity uh, supply. Uh, however, if there are several different uh, types of uh, uh, solar uh, power plants. And for example, we have parabolic trough, uh, free snail reflector, the solar tower, and the solar dish, and so on. But the highest efficiency is, is, is only about 30 uh, percent. There is a still uh, still a very large gap away from the uh, thermodynamic limit. Uh, the thermodynamic limit is about 93.1 uh, percent. So there is a long way to go. So the question is how to narrow the, narrow the gap. And if we take a look at the uh, energy utilization process of uh, solar energy, it contains uh, three processes. Uh, first is the capture of uh, solar energy and convert it into heat. And then uh, transfer, transfer of the heat into working fluid and uh, store it. And then uh, utilization. So correspondingly, uh, and we'll talk about uh, um, three uh, three uh, themes will be discussed to, uh, uh, to try to narrow the gap. First, I will discuss the volumetric uh, solar thermal conversion. So it, it aims to increase the solar thermal conversion efficiency. And then we'll talk about the multifunctional nanofluids. Uh, for this nanofluids, it can serve as heat transfer fluid and uh, it can store heat or uh, energy simultaneously. And then uh, I will discuss uh, hybridized uh, photovoltaic and solar thermal or solar, uh, solar uh, or thermal chemical processes. Okay, so uh, for the second part is volumetric solar thermal conversion via photonic and nanofluids. So we all know that the flat plate uh, solar uh, collector is the most commonly used and, uh, is, uh, and commercialized uh, uh, to convert solar energy into heat. So basically, we have a, a black, black surface. So this black surface will absorb solar energy and then convert it into heat. And then this heat will be transferred to the working fluid and then finally to the uh, molten salt to, to store it. So uh, the small resistance between, uh, between this black surface and the uh, working fluid or the, uh, will, will, have a, will result in a high temperature difference. That means the black surface will be very high if we want to uh, increase the temperature of the fluid into a certain temperature. It, it will have a, a very high radiation loss and a convection loss, uh, as had been mentioned by Professor uh, Stephen yesterday. So uh, in, in contrast to this flat type of solar collectors, we can absorb the uh, solar energy volumetrically. That means we can use water to absorb the solar energy directly. It has advantages like uh, very uniform distribution of temperature that reduce the thermal resistance because uh, uh, we, no have, uh, we, we don't have so many uh, heat transfer processes and it will, it will have a low radiative loss and, and thus we have a high efficiency. However, the common working fluid like uh, water or some uh, oil are most are uh, almost transparent uh, in the visible and the near infrared range. So, how to enhance the absorption of uh, the the solar energy for this uh, working fluid is a problem. So, uh, we think uh, so we think about uh, metallic nano uh, nanoparticles like uh, silver nanoparticles. This uh, metal nanoparticles have been made uh, uh, to nanofluids to increase the absorption. So the basically, the mechanism lies in the excitation of uh, surface plasma remnants. That means the, the electrons of these particles can oscillate uh, collectively when the, uh, when the uh, solar photon is incident on the particles. Thus, it will have a very high uh, so, uh, uh, solar absorption efficiency. And uh, especially when the dielectric uh, constant of the particle is minus two times the dielectric constant of the water. So at this condition, the absorption will have a peak. 
And uh, if we take a look at the, uh, the absorption efficiency of the silver nanoparticles, we can see that indeed for uh, some wavelengths, for example, at uh, uh, 400, maybe 420 nanometers, the, absor the absorption efficiency is much larger than one. So it, that means uh, the efficiency, the absorption property is very good. And uh, but, uh, but the negative part is that it is very narrow. That means uh, for other wavelengths, it cannot be absorbed. The solar energy cannot be absorbed by these uh, silver nanoparticles. So to achieve a very efficient uh, solar thermal conversion, so the following two conditions should be satisfied. First is the so, uh, full spectrum, not like the previous uh, uh, very narrow band. So Full spectrum means we want the, uh, the full spectrum energy can be uh, absorbed by this nanofluids because the solar energy is very broadband from uh, to, uh, 300 nanometer to 200, uh, 2,500. And second requirement is a very high absorption coefficient. So if the absorption coefficient is high, that means we will need a very little or very low concentration of nanoparticles. That means we, we don't have uh, problems like the pipe wear or the uh, increased uh, pipe work due to the um, due to yeah uh, pipe work, and also we don't have uh, some uh, clogging problems. But that means uh, we in order to achieve this goal, we should uh, very delicately design the particle shape, the particle size, and uh, the concentration. Okay, so uh, we have measured uh, different nanofluids made of dielectrics, metals, and uh, core shells. So uh, we compare the uh, silver nanofluids like this red line and uh, with, with the core shell nanoparticles like the titanium oxide uh, covered by silver. We can see that for compared with this very simple uh, silver nanofluids, the core shell nanofluids has uh, a broadband uh, solar thermal conversion but still fail to exhibit a full spectrum of solar thermal conversion. So we can see that uh, in the near infrared, the absorption is low. So no matter for this uh, silver nanofluids or the crochet nanofluids. Since the different nanoparticles may exhibit a different uh, uh, redness at a different wavelength, so intuitively how about we mix two different nanoparticles together? And for one particle, May, maybe it has a good absorption in the visible range. And for another one, maybe it's good uh, in the infrared range. So how about we mix them together? So uh, we test, the, for example, carbon nanotubes and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, uh, silver and the silicon oxide covered by the, the silver core shells. These are two different nanoparticles together. And we can see this binary nanofluids can have uh, broadband uh, absorptions. And uh, if we put the nanofluids uh, out the door, we can see the temperature increase of this binary nanofluids is, is about uh, 70 degrees. So it is much higher than, uh, than pure water. And uh, can we uh, make a step further? So, so since uh, two nanoparticles maybe can help us get a broadband absorption, but can we integrate these two particles into one particle? So that will be, uh, so if we can do this, uh, we can um, just by using one particle, but get a very broadband uh, or even full spectrum absorption. So inspired by this genus image, we propose these two phase nanoparticles. Uh, for example, uh, we designed uh, the gallium doped zinc oxide covered by this uh, uh, half, uh, half silver shell. And uh, if we take a look at the extinction coefficient of these uh, different particles, we can see for this core, for this core GZO core, we can see it has uh, a good uh, uh, absorption in the infrared range. This is because uh, uh, the, the core redness can be excited uh, and then it gives the, uh, the plot of the electric field. So if you, can, if you see that, you can, uh, it will demonstrate that uh, the mechanism of, of here due to the core redness. 
And, uh, and for this core shell, we can see that uh, we can have uh, another peak in the visible range. But this is due to the shell redness. The core redness disappears, so it, it, it is hiding. So, but if, if we use our uh, this two-phase nanoparticle, we can see both the core, the core redness and this uh, shell redness can be excited. So, so then we can get a broadband uh, absorption. And if we take a look at the, the absorbed uh, solar power spectrum, uh, for example, this, uh, um, this green line is the solar spectrum. And uh, for GZO core, the nanofluid, as, the, as shown by this blue line, you can see that it has a weak absorption in the, infra, in the visible range because uh, it is good only in the infrared, so it, it is bad in the visible range. And uh, for the core shell nanofluid, we can see it, it is not good in the infrared range. But for our two-phase nanoparticles, shown as the, uh, the red line, it can have a full spectrum solar absorption. So it, ha it has a very good overlap with the uh, solar spectrum distribution. And also if we uh, replace the good, the good uh, the outside of the gold shell into uh, cheap, uh, cheap aluminum, so the, the performance uh, still holds. And now we go to the second part, the uh, third part, the multifunctional nanofluids for efficient solar power conversion. So volumetric solar thermal conversion is uh, maybe a very promising way to increase the solar thermal conversion efficiency, but still the solar uh, irradiation is intermittent uh, that will inhibit a continuous energy output. So that's why for, for most, almost all current solar uh, power plants, we all have the energy storage system. So the, this energy storage is indispensable. And uh, for conventionally, conventionally, many energy transfer processes have to be employed if we convert the solar energy into heat and store it. For example, for this solar energy, we, we have to use the surface cooling to absorb solar energy, change it into heat. And the heat is transferred to heat transfer fluid, and then to the molten salt, to, and then finish the energy storage process. So can we just uh, uh, integrate the, uh, make the, I mean, can we just use one step to finish the energy storage process? That means, uh, can we integrate the solar thermal conversion, the heat transfer, and the thermal energy storage just into one process? That is possible if we can develop a multifunctional nanofluid that it can that it have have high thermal conductivity, high uh, solar absorptance, and a high energy storage density. So, if that we we will we will simplify the energy uh, storage process. And uh, so we designed a kind of uh, uh, nanofluid to realize that. Uh, we have uh, uh, phase changing materials and uh, uh, cover, co covering silicon oxide. Uh, silicon oxide is uh, uh, served as uh, the encapsulation, so the phase changing materials will not leak out. And also, we embellish the silver nanoparticles outside to promote the solar thermal uh, conversion because silver nanoparticles can have uh, um, a plasmonic redness, so it can enhance the solar uh, thermal conversion efficiency. So, in integrate the phase change proper properties and the good uh, solar thermal conversion properties. And we can see that indeed the silver nanoparticles will increase the, uh, the absorptance of most of all the spectrum due to the uh, uh, plasmonic redness. And also we can, see, uh, we can see the phase change of the nanoparticles and the heat can be released and stored through this phase pro uh, change process. So it can help to increase the energy Story density of the water itself, and it helps to relieve the uh, intermittency of energy output. Um, also, 
for the nano fluid, we, we know that it's the um, optical properties like uh, solar thermal conversion, efficiency, and also some conductivity can be tuned by changing the particle size, particle shape, the, uh, and so on, different methods. But this method is all uh, uh, passive, means uh, we have to change the shape and the size, but not active. So can we actively tune the thermal and the uh, optical properties on site, I mean? Uh, so we uh, use the, the ferrofluoric oxide. So it is used to increase the thermal conductivity of the water, and it can exhibit tunable uh, particle dispersion and uh, magnetic fields. So when we apply magnetic fields, so the dispersion will change. So it, it will bring some, some changes of uh, thermal of optical properties. And we use titanium uh, nitride particles to enhance the solar thermal conversion. And these hybrid uh, particles is expected to have a high uh, thermal conductivity, the high solar absorption, and uh, good tunability. So uh, this is the fabrication and the characterization of this, uh, uh, this hybrid uh, nanofluids. And uh, this is the extinction coefficient uh, simulation for different particles. We can see uh, for this titanium nitride, so it has a high absorption in the visible range. And uh, for this ferrofluoric oxide, it has uh, good absorption in the visible, uh, in the ultraviolet band, and also the near infrared. So the com combination of them will give a good absorption for the uh, most of the full spectrum. So if we compare this uh, novel nanofluids with the binary uh, nanofluids in the literature, we can see the absorption of this uh, novel nanofluids is even higher. And uh, <coughs> this is the uh, uh, solar absorption uh, changing with the uh, applying magnet magnetic field. So we can see when applying the magnetic field, we can see the absorption actually deteriorate. So for different directions, I mean the direction of the uh, illumination, when it is perpendicular to the direction of a magnetic field, it, it decreases slowly. But if it, it is parallel, it will decrease uh, very, very sharply. But, but no matter uh, what is the direction of the magnetic field, so it always decreases. The absorption is always uh, decreasing. Uh, in order to know why, so we uh, under, actually add under external magnetic field, this homogeneous distribution of magnetic particles will actually tend to form chains, very ordered chains. And this ordered chains actually is not good for the solar absorption. But uh, actually this order, uh, I mean, is, is good. But for uh, conduction, we can see if the magnetic field and the uh, direction and the heat transfer direction are parallel, that means uh, uh, under, the uh, under the magnetic uh, field, the form of the chains, I mean the chain direction, is along the heat transfer direction. So this order distribution of particle actually will have, will have heat conduction. So that's why you can see an increase of the heat conductivity uh, when we apply in the magnetic field. But if the magnetic field is uh, perpendicular to the heat transfer direction, so along the heat transfer direction, uh, heat transfer direction, the particles are still, uh, I mean, are still disordered. So it will not affect the thermal conductivity. So overall, uh, we provide a, a way to tune the uh, thermal, both thermal and the optical properties uh, for maybe for different applications. And now we will go to uh, the fourth part, the full spectrum solar energy cascade utilization. So we know uh, for the photo, no matter for the photovoltaic, for the uh, solar some power or for the solar uh, some chemical processes, uh, none of these commercial, commercial systems can um, achieve a very high efficiency. For example, uh, 30%. 
because for the commercial PV cells, we know it's only about 20, uh, 80, uh, 18 to 20 percent. And for the solar thermal power, so it's less than 30 percent. So, so that is, uh, that is not hard to understand because the solar spectrum is very broadband. So it's from 0.3 to uh, 2.5 micrometers. So it's very difficult to find uh, one technique that can harvest the photons of different wavelengths uh, very efficiently. So for example, for this uh, short wavelength of photons, it can be harvested by PV cell. It can also be harvested by the solar thermal. But the solar thermal has a high efficiency because for the uh, ultraviolet, uh, the, the optical response of the PV cell is low. So the energy, uh, the, the excess energy cannot be, cannot be used because even if the photon energy is large, but it, it can only excite uh, one electron hole pairs. So most of the energy is still lost. But for the middle wavelength photons, so it's very good for PV cell. And the converting efficiency from this kind of photon to electricity can be as high as 60%. So people have demonstrated that by using kind of laser um, PV cells. For one wavelength, it can be very high. And for this long wavelength photons, the electron hole pairs cannot be excited. So we can only have one choice. So only solar thermal can be employed. So how about uh, uh, allocating photons of different wavelengths to the most suitable places? For example, for this uh, middle wavelength photon, so we allocate, allocate them to uh, PV cells due to uh, f there it has a high efficiency. But for very short wavelengths the photons and uh, very long wavelengths of photons, so it is better go to uh, solar thermal. It can be uh, used in solar thermal power, or it can be used for solar thermal chemical. For solar thermal chemical, the photons will be uh, changed into thermal energy, and this thermal energy will drive thermal chemical reactions to produce fuels, and then this fuels can be born to produce electricity. So there are many different types of uh, the hybrid systems. One, one typical uh, PV uh, solar thermal hybrid system is shown here. The concentrated treated sunlight will be will impinge on the PV cells, and behind the PV cells we have nanofluids flowing uh, inside the tube, and the PV cells will harvest the visible visible photons. And the near infrared photon will be reflected to the tube, and it will be absorbed by uh, nanofluids. And the theoretical solar, uh, solar electricity efficiency can be obtained by uh, putting the uh, PV cell efficiency and the efficiency converting uh, heat into electricity by putting them together. So it is. Uh, uh, so it is uh, no wonder that the total solar thermal efficient, solar electricity efficiency is much higher compared with the separate PV cells or separate solar thermal power plants. And uh, there is another um, another uh, system uh, hybrid system proposed by uh, Professor Robert Taylor, and the nanofluids uh, serves as uh, some filters. So. Uh, for, for the above bandgap photons, we just uh, be transparent, penetrate through this nanofluid, and then uh, will be used by this PV cell. And the nanofluids will convert the photons outside the PV window, means convert the ultraviolet photons and also the infrared photon into heat. And also we can employ some beam splitters. For example, these beam splitters it will reflect this uh, um, visible photon into the PV cells, and the infrared part will be transparent to the to the to, to this tube. And then inside we have nanofluids, and uh, it will uh, convert uh, infrared photon into heat. 
And here, another way we propose by uh, combining photovoltaics with uh, some chemical hybrid system. So why we use some chemical uh, system? That's because uh, for a uh, solar thermal system, so if we convert the, want to convert the heat into electricity, the temperature will be actually very high. So probably we have to go to 500 degrees or maybe in the future into 700 degrees. But for nanofluids uh, at a such high temperature, it will bring us a lot of problems like the uh, stability, like that. But for thermal chemical systems, the temperature can be low. For example, they can be about uh, 200, Celsius, 200 Celsius. So it is, it is good so, uh, because it has a low temperature. Also, it has a very good ability of uh, energy storage because we, uh, the output is fuel, so not electricity. So we don't have much, many problems of uh, energy storage. And the nanoparticles or the nanofluids we use actually uh, is, uh, um, <coughs> is carbon oxide and uh, uh, covered by uh, silver. It has uh, both good solar thermal properties and good thermal uh, catalytic properties. So for this nanofluids, uh, they will absorb infrared uh, photons and uh, convert into heat and then drive the uh, some chemical, some catalytic uh, uh, reactions. And uh, if we take a look at the system, if, uh, the system performance, the performance uh, means uh, uh, the, 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 system, the efficiency of converting solar energy into uh, electricity. So uh, the PV cells, we know, will uh, output electricity directly. And for the fuels, we will burn the fuels and then uh, to produce electricity. So we produce this kind of electricity uh, together, so we have a system efficiency is about 31.2%. Uh, uh, so, and, and for this efficiency, we al already consider the concentration loss, the, the different losses, and uh, also the so, uh, and also this efficiency is much higher than the single PV cells. For single PV cells, it, it we put it uh, uh, put it out the door is about 21.9%. Uh, this is this PV cell is what we use in the system. So now it's time to the conclusion part. So the full spectrum volumetric solar thermal conversion can be achieved by uh, uh, photonic nanofluids, and uh, uh, in the future the multifunctional nanofluids uh, with the high uh, absorption, solar absorption, high thermal uh, conductivity, and uh, high energy storage density. Uh, it's promising. And also, uh, in order to increase the solar energy to electricity conversion efficiency, uh, in the future, I think the cascade solar energy utilization is, uh, is a more promising way, and also it is possible. So um, thank you for your attention.